All right, everybody, welcome to Bremer College from North Campus. Um, we thank you for coming today to the second annual Environmental Justice Symposium, a fair symposium, Dr. K out there. Um, I am the Associate Dean for the Social and Behavior Science Student Service Department. Uh, my name is Dr. Todd Bernhardt. I'm just gonna say welcome, everybody, students and non-students and panelists to our wonderful campus um, and to a great event. Uh, I know we have a lot going on today. We have uh, two, Two uh, uh, two discussions, uh, two, uh, two uh, conference discussions, and uh, we have a, a video, a movie later on, uh, "Hungry for Justice," and it's, it's a documentary and a view of that, and a discussion of the documentary as well after both um, panels. Um, without further ado, um, again, thank you very much. And there's water back there, and uh, I'm gonna get the microphone over to. Enjoy. Hello, good morning. My name is Laura Arroyo. I'm from Earth Justice. We're here for the second annual Environmental Justice Fair and Symposium. This year we're dedicating this symposium to food justice to explore and learn about the socioeconomic and environmental problems associated with the agricultural industry in Florida and how it dis disproportionately affects on minority, low income, and indigenous populations. In addition, we are going to learn different initiatives that are in, in the front of the line fighting against these injustices. I work as a, st as a staff attorney for the Health Communities Program in Earth Justice. We have a Florida Regional Office, one in Tallahassee and one in Miami. Earth Justice is a nonprofit, public interest law firm dedicated to protect the magnificent places, natural resources, and wildlife of this earth and to defend the right of all people to a healthy environment. We bring about far-reaching change by enforcing and strengthening environmental laws on behalf of hundreds of organizations and communities. I would like to thank our host, Bauer College, and its staff, especially Misa Mirzad Krijasarak, for the mission and the organization for this event with us. We also want to thank my colleagues, my colleagues at the Miami office, um, for their time, effort, and support for this event. That will be Anna Correa, Samantha Jacob, Katie Kaiman, and Tanya Galoni. Thank you. Please check out throughout the day informational tables for di from different organizations in the green market. Also, we have a quilt exposition about the Lake Apopka Farm Worker Memorial Quilt Project, which is in honor of the former Lake Apopka farm workers who died and all of whom were exposed to pesticides, organic pest, uh, to persistent organic pesticides that were used on the farmlands. That exposition is thanks is here thanks to Jeannie Economos from Farm Workers Association of Florida. Thank you. Um, today we are going to have two panels uh, from farm to food jobs to food systems and the right taken for granted. After these two panels, we are going to do a screening and discussion of a documentary called Hunger for Justice. Without further ado, let, uh, let me introduce you to our moderator for the first panel, Kate Stein. So Kate Stein is a freelance journalist focused on the environment and climate in South Florida. She reported for WLRN, NPR, and the Invading Sea Media Collaboration. Please welcome her. Apologies for reading off my phone. I didn't print off the speaker bios here today, so I'll be introducing them using the magic of the iPhone. Um, our first, we're going to go through, we're going to have 15 minute presentations from each of our panelists, and then um, we'll open the floor for a Q&A. I have some questions. Obviously, this should be about the audience questions, so we will love to hear from you. Um, our first speaker, though, is Alexis Andaman. Andaman or Andaman? Andaman. Okay, great. Um, she's a senior associate attorney with Earth Justice. She focuses on sustainable food and farming. Um, prior to joining Earth Justice, she completed fellowships at the Conservation Law Clinic, Center and Clinic at Indiana University. And she has a JD with honors and a certificate in environmental and natural resources law from Lewis and Clark. Um, Alexis, if you'd like to take the stage, Great. your 15 minutes start now. <laughs> great introduction and thanks to our hosts and the organizers today. It's really a pleasure for me to be here and to talk about 
talk about such an important issue. Um, at the outset, I have to beg everyone's pardon. I had some tech problems this morning, so I'm dealing with a little bit of a multimedia note situation. So I'm going to be bouncing back and forth um, with computer and paper. Um, so I'd like to begin by putting on my slide. Right. I'd like to begin by saying a few words about the food system itself. Uh, many of us don't often think about what happens to food before it shows up on our plate. Uh, but when I talk about the food system, I'm referring to everything that happens to food, from crop selection to disposal. There are so many choices that take place during the process of food's trip to your plate. How is the food produced? At a small independent family farm or a large monoculture operation? How is the food processed and packaged? Where is it sold? How is it prepared, consumed, and ultimately disposed of? The answers to each of those questions help to reveal the true cost of food, how it affects the environment, how it affects our health, and how it affects everybody else. It's social justice important. At each stage of that process, there are opportunities for sustainability, or the lack of sustainability, opportunities for choices that promote health, or that do not promote health, and opportunities for justice or injustice. On the whole, our modern industrial food system, which is rooted in these large-scale monoculture operations, fails to protect the environment, fails to protect human health, and fails to produce, oh, thank you. Sorry, is anyone having trouble hearing me? Fails to protect the environment, fails to protect human health, and leads to a lot of injustice. It doesn't distribute enough fresh, nutritious food, and it doesn't distribute that food adequately. Those issues, environmental degradation, health problems, and injustice are all inextricably tied together. There's no such thing as a sustainable food system that's unjust. There's no such thing as a healthy food system that's unjust. So what I'd like to do today is to discuss two examples of justice problems in our food system. The first focuses on environmental problems and injustice, and the second focuses on health problems and injustice. Diving in, uh, the first case study involves CAFOs, which is an acronym for Concentrated Animal Feeding Operation, or a huge industrial animal agriculture farm, I hesitate to call it a farm because it really does not look or operate anything like what we imagine when we hear that term. Um, CAFOs showed up in North Carolina starting in about the late 1980s, 1990s. And at that time, farming in North Carolina underwent a fundamental shift. Traditionally, North Carolina producers raised small numbers of hogs, often fewer than 25, on complex, diversified farms that were growing crops and raising a number of different animals. During the 1980s, however, the hog industry in North Carolina rapidly consolidated and became centralized. Animal agriculture shifted from independent, pasture-based family farms to a more concentrated group of producers clustered close to slaughterhouses and processing plants. So as you can see in this graph, the uh, total number of hog populations in North Carolina fell from about 40,000 in the early 1980s to less than 2,500 in 2013. But at the same time as the number of hog facilities was declining, the number of hogs actually increased from 2 to 10 million. So you have fewer facilities raising many more animals. Um, Profits, which are those green bars on that graph, also drew rapidly during the same period. But for the most part, those profits aren't going to the people who actually raise the hogs. In the new centralized system, one company, and in North Carolina it's often Smithfield, controls every aspect of production from breeding to slaughter, including what animals are fed and how they're raised, what temperature they're kept at. But those big companies contract out the work of raising the pigs. So you'll have an independent contractor who works for Smithfield, who owns the hog waste and all of the means of production. Uh, 
contract growers are paid by the number of hogs they're able to raise successfully, but their contracts aren't lucrative. This isn't a way to get rich. And they have to bear the costs of construction, which can often be really substantial. As a result, growers are stuck between a rock and a hard place, and they have to cut corners to survive financially. As a result, the integrator contractor grower system creates cheap meat while externalizing the environmental and social costs of production. And I'll go through a few examples of that. I know this is a gruesome picture, but this helps to show what folks who live next to these facilities are experiencing. Dead boxes are a way for contract growers in North Carolina to get rid of dead animals as quickly as possible. And because of how the system operates, there are plenty of dead animals. North Carolina, like South Florida, is hot. So these animals sit outside, they start to rot, they draw pests, buzzards, and black flies. And folks who live right next to these facilities have to live with those pests. Waste management is also an enormous problem at CAFOs. What you see in this picture are shelters, which are houses that contain all the pigs, and then giant lagoons of basically hog feces and urine diluted a little bit with water. That is the cheapest possible way to store hog waste. And what integrators will do is keep the waste in these giant open pits and then dispose of it by spraying it on fields. Obviously, manure can act as fertilizer, but these systems are not set up to really grow crops that anyone wants or needs. So the spraying is ultimately a disposal method. In North Carolina, there are about 2,300 permitted hog facilities. Together, those facilities can find more than 9.7 million hogs, and those hogs produce more than 9.5 billion gallons of waste. So that is about as much waste as 76 million people would produce. It's more than twice the amount of waste that is produced by the entire population of California. And unlike human waste, which we disinfect prior to disposal and try to dispose of responsibly, this just goes right onto fields with no prior treatment, and it can wash directly into the water or seep into groundwater. Uh, when that happens, it leads to uh, nutrients enter the water, leading to algal blooms, tons of problems with pollution, fish die-offs, and other really serious problems. And those aren't just environmental problems, of course. They affect the people who live in these communities who would like to go fishing in nearby streams and who would like to get their drinking water from wells. Um, this is an example of how CAFOs apply waste to fields. It's a spray gun. You see that there's a fine mist of manure coming out. And what happens is when you spray waste like that and wind comes along, <laughs> the waste is carried. We represent folks who have told us stories about waste being sprayed onto their homes, onto their cars, onto clothes they have drying out on the line. So living near these facilities really changes a person's quality of life. You can't spend time outside. You can't leave your windows open. The odor from something like this is completely overpowering. Folks have had to invest not only in bottled drinking water, but also in dryers and air conditioners so that they can take care of their laundry inside and keep their windows closed year round. And people live very close by. Um, this is a client of ours standing in front of her mailbox. Her house is maybe 20 feet away. And you can see behind her that center pivot isn't a center pivot for water, it's a center pivot for hot manure. I should mention that it's not just odor and water pollution. There's also a lot of health hazards associated with living this close to that much manure and breathing that much manure. Our clients suffer symptoms like headaches, runny eyes, runny noses, breathing difficulties, um, all sorts of serious problems. And those problems are worse for the folks who actually work at these facilities who are breathing a ton of ammonia, a ton of hydrogen sulfide every single day and often struggling with antibiotic resistant diseases because the pigs in these facilities are crowded so close together that they need to be given a lot of antibiotics so that there's not a huge breakout of disease in a hog house. So industrial hog facilities, as I sort of alluded to, are not evenly distributed in North Carolina. Instead, as this map shows, the density of hog facilities correlates strongly to the percentage of people of color in a neighborhood. In this map, Duplin County, where Renee, who you saw in a prior slide, and many of our other clients live, is almost entirely 
blacked out by those dots representing CAFOs. Uh, according to a scientific analysis that we conducted in partnership with uh, some North Carolina scientists, people of color in eastern North Carolina are more than one and a half times more likely than white people to live within three miles of an industrial hall facility. So essentially, the pork industry has started to treat traditional communities of color in North Carolina as a dumping ground for hog waste. And there's no obvious innocent explanation for this disparity. Eastern North Carolina is a coastal plain. It means it has a high water table and it's prone to flooding. It's basically the worst place you could think of to keep a bunch of poop in a hole in the ground. So we think this is an example of environmental racism and that it, <laughs> that it violates civil rights laws. I'm going a little slower than I planned, so I will quickly say that what Earth Justice is doing is uh, filing a civil rights <coughs> complaint under the Federal Civil Rights Act, which basically prohibits recipients of federal funds from using those funds to discriminate. And we think that the way North Carolina permits these facilities is discrimination. Um, there are sort of a few legal complexities having to do with that that we can talk about in the Q&A to the extent that's interesting. But one thing to note is that you can't just go to court if you're alleging discriminant impact um, discrimination under this statute and regulation. You have to actually file a complaint with EPA. So this is an example of administrative advocacy that we're doing. And the fact that you can't go to court is a problem in and of itself. So switching gears a little bit to food toxics, this is sort of an example of a health problem that implicates justice, and that's related to our food system. Chemical additives are a fundamental part of our modern industrial food system. They're used in preparation and packaging. They enhance the flavor and color of processed foods. They help to make sure that food doesn't spoil quickly during transportation. Experts estimate that manufacturers use about 10,000 chemicals in food. And that number alone isn't a bad thing. Uh, it wouldn't be a problem if we knew that every chemical that's added to food is safe. The problem is we don't know that, and neither does FDA, the agency that's supposed to actually be regulating these chemicals. The Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, which is the statute that requires FDA to ensure food safety, imposes a really rigorous process for the pre-market review of chemicals that are going to be used in food. Essentially, that means when a manufacturer decides it wants to use a new chemical, it has to tell FDA about it. That proposed use is released for public comment. There's an opportunity to folks, for folks to have a hearing and even challenge the use in court if they want to. But the law has a gigantic loophole. In 1958, when Congress imposed this pre-market review requirement, they knew that FDA didn't have the money or the manpower or the time to ensure the safety of every single food ingredient. And they knew that things that had been used for a long time, like flour, oil, vinegar, baking soda, were safe. So the law has a loophole for substances that are generally recognized among qualified experts as safe. The problem is that FDA has allowed that loophole to entirely swallow the law. In 1997, FDA began allowing manufacturers to decide for themselves whether their products were safe in secret and add those products to food without telling anybody at all. And as a result, no one, not FDA, not public health experts, not even manufacturers, knows every single chemical that's added to food. There's no transparency. That lack of transparency raises serious questions about whether these substances are in fact safe at all, or whether they're safe when consumed in combination with other secret substances. And in fact, because sometimes manufacturers will voluntarily choose to tell FDA what they're putting into food, we know that unsafe substances have been added to food and that manufacturers have wanted to use substances that are unsafe in combination with one another. Sometimes unsafe with things like sodium nitrate, which is a common preservative, or acetaminophen, the active ingredient in Tylenol, and other over-the-counter painkillers. Uh, so very briefly, because I am running out of time, this is a justice issue. Um, nobody should have to worry about unsafe chemicals in their food ever, period. That's what FDA is there for. But exposure to unsafe chemicals can be especially dangerous for low-income communities and communities of color that are already overburdened by environmental pollution and that might already lack access to quality health care or fresh, nutritious food. 
Um, those folks cannot afford additional chemical exposures, and those communities are more likely to rely on dollar stores and places of that nature to buy household essentials and food, and the food that dollar stores sell are more likely to be processed and more likely to contain these chemicals. So you've got a problem. Um, and I will very briefly say that we have had a couple cases related to this. So this is an example of some litigation that Earth Justice is doing to address injustices in the food system. We challenged FDA's approval for seven carcinogenic chemicals that were used to flavor foods. And we won, sort of. FDA said that manufacturers could no longer use those chemicals with its approval, but it didn't do anything to stop manufacturers from using them under the secret loophole. So we're now challenging the secret loophole in court and if we win, I think that would have a real chance to address this injustice in the food system. So thanks for bearing with me. All right, thank you very much, Alexis. Our next speaker is Jeannie Economos. She is the Pesticide Safety and Environmental Health Project Coordinator for the Farm Worker Association of Florida. She has more than 30 years experience working on um, environmental issues and more than 20 years experience working on farm workers issues in the state of Florida, nationally and internationally. She currently is the Lake Apopka Project, Farm Worker Project Coordinator and she's worked on some studies related to heat and worker health. So Jeannie, take it away. This panel was about food justice. It's important to understand right off the bat that our entire agricultural system is based on injustice. It's structural, it's institutionalized, and it's systemic. In the United States, the first people that were farm workers the people that worked in the fields in the United States were enslaved peoples from Africa. It's really important when we think about our food today, it's really important that we understand the deep roots and the deep underpinnings of our entire agricultural system. Because when the pioneers came to this country, they went and they set up small farms. But we had a system in the south, east of the United States, where enslaved peoples from Africa were brought over to the United States and put on plantations to do the work that nobody else would do. The work of the, the, the slave, enslaved peoples in the Southeast fed the rest of the country. It's really important to understand what people say about making America great. Our entire country was built on the backs of enslaved peoples in the southeast that were growing the food, the cotton, the tobacco, that fed the rest of the world, people that were making the railroads, building the, the factories and the warehouses in the northeast. All of those people depended on the food and the textiles that came from the southeast by enslaved peoples to build this country. It's really important to understand that very deep underpinning that affects our entire agricultural system today. In the 1930s, so slavery ended in 19, 1865, and after that, the people that had been slaves became indentured servants, sharecroppers, and the conditions were not much better than slavery. Then we came to the 1920s and 30s, and there was a big labor movement in the United States, and several labor laws were passed, and that includes the Fair Labor Standards and the National Labor Relations Act. Both of those laws that have protections for workers deliberately excluded farm workers from protections that almost all other workers in the United States have. And it's important to understand that the reason for that is, based on this legacy of slavery, the power of the agricultural corporations and companies and landholders, landholders, to influence Congress to deliberately exclude people, I use the word farm workers, but it's better to use the word people, men, women, children, families, were excluded from labor laws that protected all other workers. 
The labor force was mostly African American, black, that descended from slaves in, that had been come, come here from Africa. So it's important to understand that history. There was a demographic change in the 1960s after the Civil Rights Act was passed, and our system of agriculture was looking for a cheap, exploitable labor force. African Americans were having more opportunities to get jobs out in the workforce. And so our system of agriculture looked across the border and said, oh, Mexico, those people, we can come, we can bring them here to this country and they'll work really hard for cheap wages and don't know their rights and won't speak up. So the demographics have changed over time. Our workforce in the United States now is largely um, Haitian and Hispanic and people increasingly from Guatemala, El Salvador, Honduras, people that come from indigenous communities in different parts of the world where, that even, where Spanish isn't even their first language. But the problem is still the same. The history of discrimination, racism, uh, injustice is still at the root of our system. And that's why farm workers today are still experiencing extreme injustice in our food system. So the first thing we need to know about is when we talk about food justice, we need to think about this historical legacy because this injustice looks at people and land and animals as resources. And I have to say, I hate the word resource because inherent in the word resource is the thought of exploitation. So our system of agriculture exploits people, exploits the land, and exploits um, animals. So it's really important to understand that deep underpinning. I work for the Farm Worker Association of Florida. We are a grassroots, nonprofit organization of, by, and for farm workers. And we work to organize farm workers to fight for protections for themselves. Farm workers work in the field. How many people here eat? <laughs> okay, that's what I thought, right? Not many people don't eat and can't, you can't survive very long without eating. If you eat, whether you're aware of it or not, every single day of your life, you are tied to farm workers. Because they're doing the work. You wouldn't be able to sit here right now and go to college, go to the grocery store, and go, go to the movies if you had to worry about your where your next meal came from. But most of us don't because we don't grow our own food and harvest our own food. But there's a workforce out there that's doing it for us. They're getting paid very low wages. They're exposed to chemicals. They're exposed to horrible conditions in the environment, including heat stress from uh, changing uh, change climate, climate change and increasing temperatures in the summer and practically year-round in Florida. I want to give you a couple of examples. You're seeing the slides here. You'll see a lot of slides of uh, citrus workers. Anybody know what this is? Yes, right, very good. Do you have experience with it? No, but I know what it is. Okay. This is an orange picking sack. This is 2019. Today, in 2019, this is what farm workers use to pick oranges. You can see from some of the slides up here, they will have a huge ladder. They'll take the ladder and put it against the tree. There's no bungee cords, there's no safety net. You just have to position that ladder on the tree so that they don't fall. They go up the ladder with an empty sack. They come down the ladder with a full sack of oranges, tangerines, or grapefruit, or whatever. This sack today, in 2019, when it's full, weighs about 80 to 90 pounds. Anybody want to guess how much they get paid for a sack full of oranges? Uh, less than our agency dollars. 80 cents. Oh. For the whole bag. For the whole bag. Sorry. For the whole bag. And this is today in 2019. Think about that next time you have some orange juice or you go to the store to buy some oranges. These are people that have to climb up the tree. They have to risk things falling down on them from the tree, snakes, bugs, heat, other kinds of conditions. And this is what we're 
treating people like today um, harvest our food. And that's just the one that doesn't include other kinds of crops. In addition to that, farm workers are exposed to all kinds of chemicals. You were hearing about the hogs and all the different kinds of chemicals in our food. Well, our system of agriculture is, is monocrop crop now and huge um, farms that have hundreds and thousands of acres. And so farm owners or uh, companies or corporations feel compelled because of the pressure of pesticide companies, and we can talk about the history of that, to use chemical fertilizers and pesticides on their land. The amount of pesticides and fertilizers used every year increases because these fertilizers and pesticides deplete the soil, and monocrop increases the amount of uh, dangers of pests affecting the crop. So we get secondary exposure to pesticides, but farm workers are on the front line of pesticide exposure. I work with a group of African American farm workers who used to work on the farms on Lake Apopka. I could talk about Lake Apopka for hours, but I won't. Um, Lake Apopka is the most contaminated large lake in the state of Florida. It's contaminated because of decades use of a kind of pesticide called organochlorine pesticides that includes DDT and other pesticides. They're called persistent organic pollutants because they stay in your body and they stay in the soil. The people I work with, most of the African American farm workers, this is a case of racism, discrimination, and environmental injustice. Most of the African American farm workers that worked on Lake Apopka were exposed to the worst kind of pesticides when they were still legal, these DDT and these organochlorine pesticides. Most of them are so toxic they've all been phased out. But they were exposed to the worst chemicals um, at a time when there were no protections to protect farm workers from pesticide exposure. I began working at the Farm Worker Association in 1996. It wasn't until 1995 that we had regulations to protect farm workers from pesticides. So all those years, people were working in the field, not knowing that these pesticides were harmful. Sometimes they would bring home empty pesticide barrels and cut a hole in them and use them for barbecue grills because nobody told them. They would bring home empty pesticide containers and use them to put flour in or to put items in in their home because nobody told them. I brought this book because this is oral histories of the farm workers who used to work on Lake Apopka, who, who talk about having planes flying overhead, spraying pesticides, and then being directly exposed, and watching the, the uh, pilot laugh as he flew over, dropping the pesticides on them. They weren't given any training about the dangers of these pesticides. So most of the people that I work with have chronic health problems. I also want to show you one other thing. So a lot of the farm workers, especially the women, they didn't have bathrooms in the fields. They didn't have hand washing water in the fields. A lot of the women, this is the, this is the conditions. And some of these conditions, even though it's not legal, some of these conditions still are um, applied today. Women would have to wear pants and a skirt over their pants because there were no bathrooms in the field. So they'd have to go to the side of the field and squat down and spread their skirt around so that they can use the bathroom. The skirt is for privacy. This is the way we treated human beings who have families, who have lives. This is no way to treat people who are doing some of the most important work in our country. Think about that. If every farm worker today walked off and decided to stop working, what would we do? We'd starve. That's the reality. We would starve because none of us can go out there and do that work. So it's some of the most important work in our country, and yet they are exposed to horrible working conditions, low pay, and exposure to pesticides. There's, um, since Earth Justice is here, um, I'm going to talk about it. Um, we have um, uh, group plaintiffs on the case that Earth Justice has against the Environmental Protection Agency. There's a really bad, very widely used pesticide called chlorpyrifos. Uh, you might have heard the term, well, you guys are too young, you might not have remembered it, but um, 
There was a pesticide called Dersban that was really commonly used back in the 80s and 90s, and it was used to kill roaches, was used in people's homes. But there were some scientific studies that showed that Dersban, or this uh, chemical chlorpyrifos, caused learning disabilities, ADHD, neurodevelopmental problems in kids. The studies were so strong that EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, decided to ban all residential uses of this pesticide because of its effects on kids. I'm sorry, but there's kids in agriculture too. And farm worker kids are just important as kids in New York City or San Francisco as any other place. To this day, it's still okay to use chlorpyrifos in agriculture. Under the Obama administration, the EPA had enough scientific evidence to show that there was chlorpyrifos in all of our drinking water and on food residues on our food. So under the Obama EPA, they agreed to ban all food uses of this pesticide. Under the current EPA, they're reversing that ban, which is why we have um, we're plaintiffs on a lawsuit um, with um, Earth Justice. I could go on. There's all kinds of chemicals. I will end with one thing, and then maybe we can talk more during the question and answer. But we just found out that EPA is now approving antibiotics for use on food crops. Not just in animal agriculture, but on food crops, especially on citrus, because of citrus greening. So you can, well, you can think about GMO oranges sprayed with antibiotics coming to your grocery store soon because they're making GMO oranges, and they're, they're researching GMO oranges, and they want to spray them with streptomycin. This is not the way to treat our food system. You all said that you have to eat. If we all have to eat, we all deserve healthy food and a healthy environment. But we also deserve to give respect, justice, and dignity to the people that are working in our food system. And that's the farm workers. Thanks. Wow, Jeannie, thank you very much for bringing that to us. I think I'm struck, I mean, with your presentation as well, Alexis, that just the amount that I don't know personally about what appears on my plate. So we'll get to this more in the Q&A. Just heard a little bit. Just the tip of the iceberg, okay. Um, our third panelist is Yoka Arditi Roca. She is the executive director of the Clio Institute, which is a Miami-based nonprofit that focuses on climate education, community engagement, uh, environmental justice, and really bringing the message of, about solutions and science um, on climate change to communities in South Florida. Um, she is an Al Gore trained climate speaker. She is the founder and executive director of No Planet to Be, and she's participated in UN climate discussions, uh, I believe as a civilian contributor. Yeah. yeah. So please welcome Yoga. So first of all, I want to thank, thank the organizers and Earth Justice to, to having us come and speak about probably one of the topics that I'm most passionate about, which is the intersection of climate change um, and equity and our food system. Um, we've heard some uh, pretty potent and revelatory uh, statements from our fellow two, uh, my fellow two other spe uh, speakers on the table, but I want to talk about a, a particular subject that um, really can exacerbate conditions um, that we already heard about today, and that is uh, a changing climate. Um, raise your hand if um, you understand uh, our, our, our climate system and what's happening to our planet right now. Okay, so let me ask you another question. From a scale from one to 10, if one, you don't know anything about climate change, and 10, you're a NASA, NOAA kind of climatologist, where do you fall? Are you a five, are you a four? Okay, we have some five, five, two, three, four threes here. Okay, so we kind of have a pretty all over the place. So I'll, you're gonna have to, as an educator, I'm gonna, I have to go through the basics, and we're gonna talk about um, uh, and put everything in context at the end. But I usually like to start about this particular image because this particular image really 
to really, really makes a powerful message. And the powerful message is, this is our home. This is the only planet we have. This is where everybody you love, everybody you admire, everybody you care for, thanks. I, you could tell I, I, I wanted to walk. <laughs> I don't like to be behind podiums. But this is our home. And we live in this planet because this beautiful protected layer called an atmosphere that makes our planet not too hot, not too cold, but just right. But humans are pumping hundreds of tons of carbon pollution into our atmosphere and we're altering the chemistry of our atmosphere by putting a lot of heat trapping gases that is making our planet warm. And if you can remember from um, science class, the greenhouse gas effect, basically what it does is the, all the radiation that we get from the sun enters into our atmosphere. Some of that is absorbed by our planet. Some of them is bounced back, reflected back, mostly by our ice caps, our white reflective ice caps. But some of, the, some of that heat cannot go back to space because all those heat trapping gases that we're putting in, um, in the form of carbon pollutions, are making it stay. So that's how our planet is getting warmer. And throughout hundreds of thousands of years, scientists have been able to map temperatures in our planet, even hundreds of 800,000 years ago, and have been able to map our temperature and also the amount of greenhouse gases, particularly CO2 levels. And as you can see, as CO2 level goes up, so does the temperature, global temperature goes up. As soon as the CO2 levels go down, so, that, so does the temperature. So it's very directly related um, to the amount of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. And if you can see, for hundreds of thousands of years, we haven't gone up uh, more than 300 parts per million. Does anybody know where we are right now? Probably double or triple. Well, right there. 411 parts per million. Unprecedented levels of CO2, we've never seen those kind of levels. And does anybody remember what happened probably around this time that made it go up? Industrial Revolution, great. So when we, start, when we invented the combustion engine and we started pumping carbon pollution into our atmosphere, those um, levels started to go up. And so a lot of people ask, well, how do uh, scientists know that, you know, how much CO2 was in our atmosphere hundreds of thousands of years ago? Well, very, very clearly, they're able to map the amount of um, gas that we had in the atmosphere by um, trap gas um, bubbles in the permafrost. And they make these, they drill these ice cores in um, our permafrost kilometers down, and then they are able to bring it back to the lab and measure the amount of tiny little bubbles, as you can see on the right-hand right -hand corner, um, how much CO2 we've, um, we had hundreds of thousands of years ago. <coughs> so with that, um, we have seen, and when um, weather forecasters and, and, and meteorologists started to tracking down temperatures late 1800s, early 1900s, we've seen temperatures rising. And actually, the, five, the last five years have been the hottest on record ever since we started tracking uh, temperatures. So 2018, 17, 16, 15, and 14, the last five years have been the, you know, the hottest. And you really don't have to be a rocket science or a NASA science to see and feel that it's getting hot, hotter out there, that our nights are getting warmer and our days are getting hotter. And with that, there's an increase in wildfires, and we've seen that in California. Our oceans are absorbing the majority of that excess heat, um, and our oceans are getting warmer. And because our oceans are getting warmer, our seas are rising. And um, as you would warm a, a, bowl, uh, a pot of water to boil some pasta, you put some heat, and the level goes up, if our oceans are absorbing the majority of the water, that is making our seas rise. Um, melting, uh, glacier melting has to do also a bit with uh, sea level rise, but the majority comes from thermal expansions of our waters. Um, so we, that is specifically relevant to us here in South Florida. Um, we are seeing an enormous amount of increase already in low-lying um, coastal areas are already suffering sunny day flooring, uh, flooding. 
Um, but in addition to that, uh, the absorption of all that CO2 that, is get, that the oceans are warming is making, is making our water more acidic. And between the, the warming of our ocean temperatures and the increased pH levels, we're starting to see rapid decline of our coral reef systems. In fact, in Florida, uh, and especially in the Keys, only 10% of our um, reef systems are standing. Uh, but what happens when the temperature goes up? So as the temperatures continue to increase, increase our water cycle intensifies and we started to see extreme precipitation increasing in extreme um, weather events throughout actually the country and we're seeing these huge downpours that look like massive rain bombs become more and more frequent and we're starting to see these headlines become very more um, predominant and uh, catastrophic flash flooding events in many parts of the country as we are experiencing right now in the Midwest if you have seen the news lately. So warming temperatures not only is causing sea level rise, um, uh, we're seeing sea ice shrinking and that creates a feedback loop because um, our polar caps are, are the cooling system of our planet and I want to show you this real quick video. <laughs> If you look at it from space, the top of the world, the white ice acts like a reflector, like a mirror that sends back sunlight and energy and heat back to space. That's what made the Arctic the cooling system of the planet. I was walking with Leo on the edge of the sea ice in the high Canadian Arctic and I told him we will not be able to stand on the frozen sea anymore in about 25 years. Scientific projections are that by 2040, there's going to be almost no sea ice left in the entire Arctic. Climate change through warming and acidification is affecting the entire ocean. Because of that, the Arctic is warming and melting at a rate that is faster than anything else we've seen before. All that white cap that expands in the winter and contracts in the summer, every time it's expanding less and shrinking to a smaller volume. That means massive melting of glaciers, no more sea ice. For all these animals that depend on the sea ice for their survival, like the seals and the polar bears, the populations are going to crash. For the rest of the planet, the melting of the sea ice is going to be associated with more extreme weather events. Some areas are going to experience more flooding, some areas are going to experience more droughts. So I don't think we're going to be very happy with the climate that's coming. There is only one thing that needs to happen to solve the issue of climate change, which is reduce dramatically our carbon emissions, our carbon pollution. That's it. We need to move from a fossil fuel dominated society to a society where renewable energies are more and more dominant. We cannot pretend that this is something that somebody else in the future will have to deal with. We have to take action right now if we are to preserve a beautiful and wonderful planet that we will be very happy to live in. So because of sea levels um, rising, uh, Florida is considered one of the most vulnerable states in the country um, to climate change impacts. Um, in fact, uh, a lot of our uh, existing property right now in our coast um, are exposed and are risking, are actually facing the risk of inundation and about $152 billion worth of it. Um, Miami Beach is one of those um, poster childs for sunny day flooding um, and we are already experiencing extreme weather events um, with unprecedented intensity. Uh, you remember Hurricane Irma, um, you remember most recently last year Hurricane Michael, this was Mexico Beach before, this was Mexico Beach afterwards. So the intensification of hurricanes are directly related to um, warming temperatures in our oceans. So is our Florida algae, um, algal bloom crisis. It's connected to increased temperature levels and also increased CO2 levels in our oceans. Uh, algae are uh, basically they're plants and they feed on CO2. So we've seen a direct relationship and increased amount of um, uh, algae uh, events due to increased CO2 levels in our water. Um, this is costing our economy a lot of money 
And we are seeing that this is also a huge public health threat. In fact, um, one of the things that I want to talk about is extreme heat, because extreme heat, it actually is the number one cause of death, um, more than all extreme weather events. And it is very relevant to us here in South Florida. As you can see, increased temperatures are on the rise here in our region. Uh, we are going to be seeing um, um, extreme heat events and heat waves become more predominant. In fact, by 2050, we see, we're going to see more and more danger days with heat index of about, about 105 degrees. So think about our labor workforce and our farm workers. In fact, I wanted to put this out, and which is this is a report that came out late last year, which was done by Farm Workers Association and Public Citizen that found that um, out of four, out of five farm workers, four were already experiencing um, threshold levels of exposure to heat stress. So, meaning that the majority of our farm workers are working in really unlivable conditions and. Uh, basically, that is going to translate and exacerbate into uh, bigger and more uh, uh, risky uh, heat days to all our farm workers, which is obviously a, a justice issue. But I wanted to talk to uh, two major impacts that are, um, especially since we're talking about the food system, but I want to talk about two things that are driving our entire whole global health systems. Obviously, it's increasing average temperatures and to the changing rainfall patterns. And the reason why that is affecting our health is because it affects the food we eat, the water we drink, the air we breathe, and the weather ex we experience. And I wanted to kind of um, go really quickly into how food and our food system um, is really being impacted by a changing climate. Obviously, rising temperatures and concentrations of CO2 in the atmospheres are threatening our global nutrition. Reducing crop yields and levels of nutrition in major food staples like rice, wheat, and soybeans. Um, so, but there's also a, an interesting dilemma with our food system. As climate change impacts our food systems and our food supply, our own agriculture and livestock practices are a major significant of um, uh, climate change and greenhouse gases. So we have a really interesting food dilemma here. Um, so why does, that, why does that have to do with climate change? Well, they are responsible about a one-eighth of total um, emissions of greenhouse gases made by humankind, anthropogenic. So that's a huge contribution. But at the same time, when we really think about it, um, you know, almost a, uh, a third of the population um, is really is expected to be obese by 2020. So um, we have not only lacking nutri nutrients uh, for a healthy life, we have 800 people going hun hungry every day. So we really have to think about all the in 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 interest and in, uh, interrelation between how we produce food and how we dispose food um, in, in our food system. As I said, Crop yields are going to decline, increased crop pests because of increasing temperatures, nutri nutrient loss because of increased CO2 levels. Um, higher temperatures will affect our livestock and will reduce our productivity, uh, particularly because of heat stress. Um, obviously, we know already that um, a changing climate is driving increase in coffee beans and coffee prices, and um, we're, uh, the projected production loss may be up to 40% by 2050. Um, we're going to see a decline in, eco in marine ecosystems. Um, thus, we're going to see um, things like alga, alga blooms becoming uh, a, a tremendous risk for the shellfish um, industry, as well as ocean acidification, because some of these shellfish are, are losing their, um, their actual um, exoskeleton due to increased calcium carbon, carcinate, carbonate in the waters. So um, with that, that poses a huge food security issue, and we're seeing uh, places in different parts of the country, but I, I chose to uh, show this later incident in Central America that really um, actually was one of the major reasons why many people were leaving Central America to come to America. And it was, it, at the root of it, was a huge um, uh, drought that decimated 80% of the region's maize and bean crop. So basically, at the root of that um, Central America caravan, climate was a major driver um, uh, forcing all these people to migrate. So we're seeing uh, climate refugees and climate migrations um, already pre um, 
you know, posing a huge um, issue for, for, for here at home. So what do we do? I want to be very quickly because I know we, we lost a lot of time on that video. The reality is we cannot you know, wait any longer. There's definitely a lot of solutions that we have right now to decarbonize our economy. And one of them is obviously choosing clean energy choices um, that do not pollute. Um, at this, uh, we know that uh, renewables is the way. We can see here how China has decided to invest billions of dollars into um, electrifying their um, grid with clean energy sources. We have many examples here at home. To all these cities are running on 100% renewable energy. We've seen an increase in solar installation here in South Florida. In fact, yesterday here in Broward County, the first solar co-op was announced. So if you um, miss that, check on it. Uh, so you can get really good affordable, uh, affordable prices when you join a solar co-op. The reality is we need to be more efficient and, and move more, smarter and, and also look at uh, different ways that go beyond technology. And I wanted to bring this out because the Drawdown Project is probably the most comprehensive pro um, project out there to reduce greenhouse gases, and they have identified 100 solutions. So, and I chose the top 10 based on their um, uh, actually efficiency and ranking order. But if you see out of the top 10 here, three of them are part of the food system. So, and that makes sense, right? Because if we have a system that is not only um, producing climate change with the, with the way we grow it, with the way we treat our land, with the way we dispose and, and waste food, um, so those should be also opportunities. And if you really look at this, um, number three in, in the rank is reducing food waste, which is huge. You will probably never think about reducing your food waste as a way of to solving the climate crisis. But um, there are many other ways to really look at the food system in a more climate-friendly way, like silvopasture. Instead of really clearing down land and deforesting areas to, to have livestock, um, we can actually use uh, a combination of trees and forage plants where it can be a more integrated uh, way of uh, raising livestock. So that's uh, solution number nine. Solution number four is eating a plant-rich diet. Hopefully, um, if, I mean, if you think about it, if you reduce the amount of meat you consume, um, you not only will be saving, uh, you know, giving benefits to your own health, but you'll also be um, helping the environment. But I want to talk about this one because this one I think is probably where we have the biggest opportunity, which is reducing the amount of food waste. If food waste will be a country, and as we know, China and, and the U.S. are the top big emitters, if food waste will be a country, it will be the third largest because of the amount of greenhouse gases it emits. It produces methane, and methane is a very potent greenhouse gas, sometimes 25 times more than CO2. So that's a huge opportunity there. But let's just step aside from the climate benefits of reducing food waste. So let's just talk about how much food we waste in this country, and think about the living condition of all those farm workers to produce that food. Well, all those farm workers' hard work and labor uh, and unlivable conditions that they face to go to really translate in something that 40% of their job goes to waste because 40% of the food we produce in this country goes to waste. So um, not only that poses a, a huge economic loss at a, a value at our $165 billion annually, but again, you know, as we said, it's a huge um, um, source of greenhouse gases. Um, how, how can we reduce re, uh, greenhouse gases and food waste? by composting, if you can compost your food waste, um, it's a great way of enriching your soil. Um, you know, our choices matter. I wanna just kind of go quickly on some of the things that you can do and implement, but I wanna get actually with, um, since we're running out of time, I wanna end with this quote, because this is important. I mean, we have seen that addressing the inequalities um, and disparities of our food system can really improve the livelihood of our farm workers. And right now our food system may be exploiting our, our people, um, as our, my fellow uh, speaker said earlier today, but also our food system is trashing our planet. We are terrestrial animals and we depend on our land for our food, but at the moment, we are trashing our planet to grow food that no one eats. 
and also mistreating our own people. So I'm going to end with this other quote because we started looking at a beautiful picture of our planet. And I wanted to remind that the Earth is what we all have in common. And we cannot damage it without damaging those with whom we share it. This is our home. There's no planet B. Thank you. <laughs> Quick announcement, there's a uh, Clio uh, Climate Symposium at the end of the, the April. Please make a note of if you're interested. We're going to have two-day event with a lot of great interesting topics. So thank you so much. Great. Thank you, Yoka. Um, okay, wow. So sitting here, I'm really struck by, like, when I sit down to lunch today, if I have, you know, a ham sandwich and a piece of fruit, and I just kind of take for granted that it's on my plate, there's this whole backstory to it that I had no idea about. You know, whether it's the pigs in North Carolina or the oranges that someone climbed a tree in Florida to harvest, and then all of the transportation to get that to me. That's really, it's really eye-opening to sit and think about how vast our food system is and how many people it touches, and we sort of take that for granted. And I guess my overall, I mean, we talked about you know the institutional and legal, legal injustices in our food system. We talked about the farm workers, and we talked about the role climate change is playing in making our food system more vulnerable, you know, less opportunities to grow crops like wheat, or you know, the impacts to our fisheries. But I guess the common theme that I found from all of your presentations was this idea of kind of our own ignorance. And so, I wanted to ask you all, each of you, if you could just respond briefly. Um, what do you think is the most important thing we can do as consumers of food, you know, as the people who sit down to have lunch? What do you think is the most important thing we can do from each of your perspectives to make the food system more equitable and sustainable? If you could just point us in the direction of one thing. And since you're next to me, Alexis, I'll start with you. One thing, one thing is tough to answer for a couple of reasons. I mean, I think there are things you can do as an individual and they're important things, but I would say maybe the one thing is organize because it's not just you creating the problem and it's gonna be a hard problem to fix alone. So, so I think if I were to say one, it would be find out more about the Farm Workers Association of Florida, find out more about the Clio Institute, find out how you can work together. Um, personal choices, I think, understanding the cost that comes with cheap food, that when you're buying cheap meat, someone is paying for it, the environment is damaged as a result, communities are suffering, workers are suffering. These things don't just happen magically, and you can't have very inexpensive bacon without causing a problem for somebody else, which is not to say that everyone has to be vegan tomorrow, but understand what these choices mean and try to think about that. So Jeannie, um, same question, what's the, one of the most important things we can do as consumers? Well, I would agree. I mean, um, every time we do a presentation, people ask, you know, oh, what can we do? What can, how can I change my habits or what can I do? And that's a good question to ask. There are things that you can do personally, but the best thing that you can do is take it to the here and take it to other people. Make other people aware of it and organize. Organize a group on campus, organize a group in your church, try and raise awareness among other people. Um, it's really important that be people become aware of this because that's the only way we're gonna make change. We're gonna have to make change on a local level. We can do things at a local level. Everything from, I know it's a little corny, but like the community garden is really important. You can use the community garden for change. The Farm Worker Association, we have five offices in the state of Florida and four of our offices have community gardens. But for us, the community gardens aren't just about growing food. They're about social justice and systemic change. We have community gardens to try and challenge the industrial agricultural system. So you can use a community garden as a way to educate other people and talk to your political leaders because we need to make change at the local. You can start local and try to make changes in your local community. Um, and, and, it, and it takes people power to do that. You can't do that on your own. Um, try and convince your local grocery stores, try and convince your local. But there are a few programs, like there's a thing called the Good Food Purchasing Program. And um, that is, uh, several um, cities around the country have adopted that. And that program um, 
asks like school systems within a uh, you know school district to uh, um, identify where they source their food so that their food is um, sustainable, they get from sustainable sources where they have good working conditions for people all along the food chain. There's also the Agricultural Justice Project, but we'll probably hear about that later. Um, but there are some different um, um, programs out there that you can um, find out about. Um, but one thing is the Good Food Purchasing Program. That's just the start. But the, to tackle the big problems, you really have to organize and get out there and, uh, and vote. And there will be quite a few organizations outside with tables after the panel is done, so definitely go check those out. If I can say one more thing real quick. There's, right now, the Congress is debating the Green New Deal. It's really important that you weigh on, in on that because the Green New Deal can make a difference and there are some organizations, including the Farm Worker Association, that are trying to influence the Green New Deal in terms of agriculture, because right now it's really not addressing agriculture. And we're putting together a letter to, to Congress that will come out in a couple of weeks um, to say that you cannot address climate change if you don't address agriculture's impact and if you don't address and incorporate low-income community um, low-income communities of color as part of the decision-making process.